what we're doing is I'm going to do a quick and dirty review on normalization, even though I think you guys already did or started working on your normalization lab. I think. It's hard when you're not running the lab. Um, so I'm going to run through an example really quick, and then I'm going to go from this to a conceptual, to a logical, to a physical diagram. Then I'm going to hand out some other stuff. So, right now, here's an example. It's called orders. Nothing's been identified. So there's a, no primary keys identified. And if you remember, curly brackets is a repeating group. So there's a repeating group and no primary keys. Now, what's, this is the unnormalized form. So what's the definition of the first normal form? Yeah, so a bunch of people said the same thing. So primary keys are identified and there's no repeating groups. And there's two ways of doing that. But right now we don't have any data to play with. So based on this, we can't do method one, which is just fill in all the blanks. So we have to go with method two, which in the end, you'd have to do no matter what. So for method two, what we need to do is we need to go and create two objects and break out the to get rid of the repeating groups. Now, I'm going to grab a couple different colors here to help identify a few things as I go. Now, to identify a primary key, is if we get rid of the repeating groups, our primary key ends up being a such. But I need lots of room. Come closer. Space right here. Okay. What I did is I got rid of the repeating group and I put that as part of the primary key. So this is in our first normal form. There are no repeating groups. In here, when you look inside the, the repeating group, you can see that this is dependent on that inside the repeating group. Thus, this is the identifier for this stuff. And we can look here, and we know that this is dependent on that. So to get it to the first normal form, we get rid of like, the repeating group by making the, identi the potential identifier for the repeating group as part of the primary key, which brings us to this. So this is first normal form. There are no repeating groups, and the primary key was identified. Fairly straightforward. That's step one. Now, second normal form. What's the definition of second normal form? First you have to be in first normal form and right. So that's known as a no partial yeah, partial dependencies. So you want no partial dependencies. And it has to be in first normal form. So to identify our partials, let's go with purple. Right now, when we look at this, the part description and the quantity depends on the part number. So these is a partial dependency. All this is a partial dependency. Do you see a pattern here? It's exactly the same situation as it was above, except now we need to get rid of partial dependencies. So how do we get to that goal? We'd go two tables. And inside this table, we have order ID. 
order date. Supplier ID, supplier name. Like such. In our second table, we have part number. Now, we do have to make one concession here to data. Is if originally the order ID was also part of the primary key for this guy, once we break it down here, we have no links back to the order because this was part of the repeating group. So if we take part of that repeating group and we bring it down here, now we've lost the fact that it's part of the order unless we include the order ID in there for the ride. And we identify our primary key for each table. And we just so happen to also have a foreign key in this table, which if we want to, well actually we should. So it's a compound primary key. So the part number and the order ID identify, the order ID connects it to orders. The combination of part number and order ID identifies the rest. Now, uh, this table is now in actually in third normal form. Um, maybe, depending on how you want to interpret third normal form. We still have two problems left. So, what's the definition of third normal form? Yeah, that's the one. So, you have to be in second, and you can have no transitives. What is a transitive dependency? Yes, so a transitive dependency is an attribute that depends on an attribute that is not part of the primary key. If we look at this one, you can see here that supplier name is dependent on supplier ID, and somehow we accidentally created a partial dependency as we brought things down. So now, to get this into a third normal form, we have one more step, which is as follows. So now we have four tables, joy of joys. So in here we have, again, order ID, order date, and the supplier number. Order lines, we've got the part number, order ID, quantity, part number, part description, and we got Identify all our primary keys, which and in here the order ID is also a foreign key. That's a foreign key. That's a foreign key. That's third and F. This should look very, very familiar. It looks an awful lot like part two of the lab. It's pretty much a solution for part two of the lab. 
So depending on, this is based on a few assumptions. In this case, we were assuming that each order can only go to one supplier. Theoretically, if we decided that the supplier is actually part of the part number, then it would look different. So that's based on the most information we had. We made this decision. So we have four entities. We have orders. We have parts. Wires, parts, That was kind of dumb. So if we were to take this and convert it to a conceptual, this is what you end up with as a result. The supplier has the priority in the, well, I should say supplier name, but I guess I got lazy. Orders has the order ID, the order date, and a foreign key of supplier ID, which matches this. Each supplier can be used as a source for an order, but each order must have at least one supplier. It can only have one supplier. Each order can have many order numbers. I mean, uh, many order lines, but each order line must have an order, because you can't have an order line without an order. And each order line is also made up of a part number, which is, which is fed from parts. Each part can be in one or zero, one or more order lines, and each order line must have at least one part. And at most, one part per order line. Which brings us to this, turns into this. Okay, now, what's the difference between a logical and a conceptual? Uh, mostly the layout and you start adding a few other things to the mix. Um,
quite so. Although this looks like it represents the exact same thing. There's some more information we can throw on here, and I really didn't give myself enough room. Um, this is when you can start marking certain things as not null. Normally I'd put those inside the box. And we're saying, okay, these things are required. The supplier ID is not null. And since these are part of the prim key, primary keys are always not null by default. So that becomes this. It's looking, it should start looking a bit like the toad diagrams you guys are used to looking at. So this is a logical diagram. Depending on who's doing the logical diagram or what software you're using to create the logical diagram, it may show what they call a domain on here. A domain is a primitive data type. In other words, is it a character field, is it a date field, is it a text field? There's no precision on how much, you know, how many characters can it hold, what size of number it is. It's just, you know, an integer field. So it's a primitive data types. Uh, but most software, when they do the logical, they don't show the data types. It just shows the table, the relationships, and what the attributes are inside of each, including how everything interconnects. So that's, we went from uh, normalization textual to conceptual with attributes to attributed logical, which is, you know, essentially that in a different form with a little extra bit thrown on as the not null stuff. And the next step will be going to the physical. The physical is where you set the file, the ground rules of what the data is going to actually look like in the database. So now I'm going to talk about, it's a newish topic, and I'll actually be posting this stuff on Blackboard as soon as I remember to do it, is something called naming conventions. Now, naming conventions are a topic of contention in the land of database. It's basically been, you know, you hear about all these holy wars in computer land. You'll hear about, you know, C versus C++, C++ versus Java versus C Sharp, PHP versus Python. You'll hear about these fights between languages and who's right. Who's got the best language to do the job? It, the answer is whatever language, language works for you that you can do the job and you're not getting attacked. That's the answer to that holy war. However, in database land, there's been this holy war called naming conventions. It's been going on for 40 years. And a while back, there's a few people that came out and decided these are the naming conventions because it was driven by business. People had to deal with business people. Therefore, they came up with the naming conventions that business people understood such as things like object names were singular, primary keys were always the name of the table, underscore, something, that kind of stuff. Mixed case was okay, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. Now, about seven years ago, would we say, there was a new product that hit the internet and a new development platform. It was the absolute bomb. As, as people thought, it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. The problem is that the developers thought they were talking about the language. Everybody else was talking about something called a framework. There was this language that came out called Ruby. Ruby had a framework called Rails. It was known as Ruby on Rails. Rails was fantastic. It was so good that everybody said, this is such a good idea, we're going to copy it. And then Ruby died. died. The language went almost nowhere. It's still around, but almost nobody makes anything new in Ruby. Why? because you can do the same thing with every other language that's out there that has tons more developers attached to it. And, but what was magical about Ruby is it involved something new called an ORM, an Object Relation Mapped System. What this does is if you follow certain naming conventions in the database, the, the framework and thus the programming language knows the insides of your database and how things are connected. And it's able to guess at the database commands to retrieve the data. It's able to guess very, very accurately, mind you, how to write the data to the database without having programmers write out entire SQL statements to retrieve data, to insert data, to update data. And the thing is, is with these naming conventions is they've become almost what you'd call a de facto standard. Now, do you know what a de facto standard is? If you don't know what a de facto standard is, here's the explanation. 
A de facto standard is a standard that's been agreed upon by a large group of people that has not gained acceptance of an actual name and body such as ISO or the IEEE. In other words, more and more people are jumping on this bandwagon of these naming conventions. And some of these people include Microsoft and IBM and, you know, all the major framework developers. The only ones that haven't jumped on this bandwagon are, I don't know, Oracle and a lot of the people that push the old naming conventions. Now, when we talk about naming conventions, there's a funny thing here, though, is no matter where you go work, they may have their own rules. So the rules I'm going to give you guys may not apply when you go out in the real world. However, these are the rules that will be applied to you guys on your assignment. And this set of rules, as I said, is becoming more and more popular. So for PHP, there's Cake PHP. If you guys take web development, you'll hear about Laravel. These are frameworks. Uh, Python has Django, and there's threats for Java. And C Sharp has its own little magical thing that does something similar. So every major language has a toolkit. And this toolkit, if you follow this naming convention, is magical. And the other trick about this naming convention is your database becomes portable from one database server to another. So you can take your database structure from Oracle and port it to, say, Postgres. And if you follow the same naming conventions, you have very little code changes to do. Instead of having to rewrite half the application, you change your connection, you change a few little bits and pieces where you might have customized how you talk to the database, and you can now run on Oracle, or on Postgres, or on MySQL, or Microsoft SQL Server. And without further ado, here are the naming conventions. This one's important, because that's what you get graded on on your assignment. Rule number one. Rule number, that's one. That's supposed to be a one. Everything is lowercase. No mixed case, no screaming, no camel case. Everything is lowercase. And here's why. MySQL is case insensitive. Microsoft SQL Server is sometimes case insensitive, depending what language the database server was installed in or what language Windows is running under it. Postgres is anally retentive about case sensitivity. Why? Because its progenitor was case sensitive also. It's been case sensitive. Postgres is case sensitive. Even one back was called Ingress. And by the way, Genesis here at the school runs on Ingress. So these old database systems are still around and they're still running. And it was case sensitive. Oracle lies. When you create an object in Oracle, whether you make it uppercase, lowercase, mixed case, it stores the nice name in the system catalog, as in whatever you typed in when you created it, and then it makes it uppercase and stores the uppercase version, so it stores both at all times. So it tells you, I'm case insensitive, but it's not really case insensitive. It's just saying, I'm just going to assume you made a mistake when you typed this, and we're going to compare it to the uppercase version. To make everything portable from one server to the other, make everything lowercase, and it'll work everywhere. That's rule number one. Rule number two, and that is a proper two. Table names are plural. Tables are plural. This is the one that's causing all the old database designers from years ago that went to school and learned the old way of naming things. This is one that's giving them kittens because it used to be everything was singular. However, the ORM guys are saying, it's a customer's table, and each row contains a customer. You can have many rows, therefore it contains customers. And the other one, but the, develop, the, the old designers say, this identifies a customer. And each row is an instance of a customer. Do you notice I'm just repeating the same words? I'm just using them in different places. And that's, believe it or not, this is what's causing the, the holy war, is this one. Number three. 
primary keys are called ID. And only ID. Not order underscore ID. Not customer underscore ID. Not ID customer. Or customer ID without an underscore. It's ID. Why? I'm going to go back to the ORM. If the primary key is always called ID, the code can guess that what your primary key is going to be called. It's going to be called ID. If it knows it's ID, and it's always ID, before it knows it's called ID. Number four is the one that everybody has a hard time with. Okay, you guys know what FK stands for, right? Foreign keys. Foreign keys has a formula. There's a rule, a pattern for the foreign key. It is singular parent. And apparently I don't know how to type that, how to write the word type. I'm not even typing. Parent table plus underscore plus parent table primary key. That's how a foreign key is named. Now, let me give you an example. If a table is orders, and that should be lowercase, the foreign key would be ID. Why? It is the ID of an order. Where do you find the order? In the orders table. The concept is fairly straightforward. That's what the foreign keys are called. And the last rule, number five, which really should be right after number one. No Notice I wrote that one in red. No spaces ever. The SQL language uses spaces as keyword delimiters. So if you put a space in your table name, guess what it thinks? It thinks it's two things. And since all database servers use something different to identify system objects, like there are special characters so you can use spaces, every server uses a different character. Postgres uses double quotes. MySQL uses backtick. Microsoft uses square, bra uh, square brackets. There's no standard on how to identify system named objects. I think Oracle uses double quotes also. Don't use spaces. Okay? These are the rules. You will be graded on this on your assignment. I'll be posting these as part of the assignment so you guys don't forget what your rules are. So now I'm going to take this and transform it into a physical diagram. And I'm actually going to not do like I did last week. I'm actually going to do it on top of this one. So I'm going to modify each of these as I go. And how I'm going to do it is I'm going to erase the end. And I'm going to erase the contents and rebuild it so you see how it transforms. Suppliers will become lowercase suppliers. The primary key is ID. Now, supplier name you can leave here. There is an unwritten sixth rule, but the problem is that nobody's agreed on it yet, even amongst the de facto people, is what should you call your descriptor field? The descriptor field is the field used to identify the row for a human can understand it, as opposed to that being, you know, a synthetic key or whatever. That People haven't always agreed what you call it. Some people call it description. Other people call it name. I go with name. But as long as you stay consistent throughout, I don't care which one you use. But I'm going to use name. Okay? Now, 
Again, ID is our primary key. What we do, what we do do at this point is we start assigning data types. Now, ID. I'm going to make it a big serial. Big serial is a special data type for Postgres. I'm going to make this as if I was designing this for Postgres. Postgres, the big serial in Postgres is a big integer plus an auto increment functionality. In other words, it creates a synthetic key and it automatically increments. That's what big serial does. Essentially, it's a big int or an int 8, depending, they're the same thing, plus auto increment. In MySQL, that'd be integer with the auto increment. In my, my Microsoft SQL server, it'd be an INT with the identity keyword attached to it. Postgres says, to heck with creating another keyword, we'll just create a data type that does this job. Our name will be a varcar. And I'm using varcar because I'm too lazy to type character varying. They mean the same thing. Varcar and character varying are the same thing. And I'm going to make it a varcar 50. And this one is not null. There's my first table, transformed. Now I'm going to do parts really quick. And you'll notice something that's going to happen, and you'll understand why the naming conventions are the way they are. They look exactly the same. That means when you're working in a language like Java, where you create functions to access each of these objects, instead of create, let's say you have 25 reference tables in your database, and you'd have to create 25 functions, you could create a single function, you feed it the name of the table as the one argument, and it'll return you the contents, like magic. Now, I'm going to do the same thing with the rest of it. That's what happens to the orders table. Now you can see our foreign key matches the supplier's table. I'm going to do the last transformation here. Oh, I guess I need to keep my uh, relationship here. Like that. And I'm going to transform order lines. However, I'm going to do one last thing. and. Actually, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say something, but I'm going to change my mind.
And there's your transformation from a logical to a physical. What's the difference between the logical and the physical? The physical follows the naming conventions and it includes the precise data type for each of the items. So our primary keys are big serial because big serial auto increments. The foreign keys match the primitive of the, the parent key. In other words, since big serial There we go, that makes a bit more sense. The big serial is the big int plus the auto increment. Therefore, the foreign key matches the primitive, which is the big int, of the parent key. Order date is timestamp because as I've said, if you deal, need to deal with a date, you might as well include the timestamp. That way, you don't have any loss of data if they suddenly ask you, you know, time related. Now, how many orders are placed in the first half of the day? I don't know. If you're just tracking our dates. Um, quantity I used as an integer because in this case I was assuming everything were, were whole items because they're parts. But if you were dealing with, you know, baking goods or linear feet, you know, it could be 22 and a half feet or two and a half yards or, you know, three and a half meters for those that like metric. And I marked off what's not null. And I purple underlined what was foreign keys and re underlined red as part of the primary key. The only thing that you could do differently is on this one, uh, depending on whose rules you follow. A lot of people say stop doing the compound key and create a single synthetic key in here instead. So in here you'd have an ID like this up here and these would just be foreign keys and not be part of the primary key if that makes sense to what I'm saying, is they say don't make compound keys. Just have a synthetic key and have those as foreign keys that are marked as a unique index. What's the difference? Depending what framework you're working with, some of them can cope with this and some can't. That's the limitations of the programming language you're working with, not a rule of database design. So this is a perfectly valid answer to what we started with originally. So nailed it. I had to be done in one hour. <laughs> it's exactly six o'clock. No dashes, those are underscores. That's an underscore. Underscore yes, dash no. Do you know, want to take a guess why you can't use dash? Yes, it's a subtract. So in this case you could say order minus date supplier minus ID if you use the dash. Dashes are bad because databases can do math. Lots and lots of math. They do it really, really fast. Yes? Well, in this case, because there's, because I'm, because in this case, what's the point of having a supplier if you don't have the name of the supplier? Can you place a note? Should you be able to place an order without giving it a number of some sort, even if it's zero? Yeah, yeah, actually, in this case, it is not null because of this. Yeah, it's one to many, optional many, mandatory one. So if you really want to argue about it, we can do this. Yes. This one, this, you can have a supplier that you haven't placed an order with yet, but you can't place an order unless you have a supplier for it. I, I don't know if he was done yet. Well, in this case, because there's not a lot of data to work with. If we're working with a full-size database, for example, the supplier would have address one, address two, city, province, postal code, phone number, fax number, email. There'd be a lot more data and some of it would be optional and some wouldn't. It just so happened based on the simple little example I was working with, pretty much everything is required. There we go. Two questions for the price of one.
Assignment one. You guys knew you couldn't get away with the, the see yeah, the course outline says two assignments. This is the first of two. Yeah, I want it in ten minutes. No. Just hold on, don't panic yet. Okay? Assignment one. Now as part of the course outline, unfortunately, it states that we have to have at least one assignment as part of a group. Assignment one's group work. I know how much we all love group work. I love it as much as you guys do for different reasons. And that's being, I was being sarcastic if you didn't catch that. Okay, assignment one is up. You guys should be able to see it. You guys will see currently assignment one instructions. There's another entry just a little bit below this. This is the teacher's view. Because it's group work, you cannot see assignment one until you've joined a group. However, I have made the instructions available as a separate item so you can at least see what the instructions are. You cannot submit unless you're part of a group. So what you want to do is you want to form groups of two or three, no more than three, because at that point there's almost no work for each person to do. Somebody's going to sit there and basically twiddle their thumbs. It is possible to do this as part as a group of one. However, it's a bit of work. Now, my assignments are set up that you have two weeks to do them. Okay, that's piece of information number one. You have two weeks to do it. Piece of information number two. So one assignment, one, two weeks. Information number two is you also, um, next week there's no lecture. It's a work period. So you can come in, sit in here if you're having problems, and ask for help. Also, the lab. I'm going to discuss it with Cheryl, but essentially, you guys have lab five in this assignment. I always make one lab an assignment period and one lab, the, like lab five. This time I think I'm going to say you can work on lab five over both weeks and the assignment over both weeks. You get to choose your workload yourself. However, lab five is still going to be due when lab five is due. The assignment is going to be due when the assignment is due, which is two weeks from today, end of day. 11.59 p.m. It is due. At 12.01 p.m., you get ten, you get a 10% penalty. Everybody in your group gets it, not just you. It's an automatic 10% off the top. If you suddenly discover you can no longer submit the assignment, which means it's now been three weeks, what, what grade do you think you get? Zero. You just made my life easy. Like with everything else, if life happens, that's okay. In other words, you sign up for a group and the, everybody says, yeah, we're all going to work together on this. And nobody does anything. And you're the only one working on it. Let me know before the, like, you know, 11.50 p.m. That part of this whole group work is learning to work as a group and being able to make decisions that you discover there's dead wood in the group and what do you do with this dead wood? There's a few choices you can do with the dead wood. Toss it overboard, set it on fire, let the teacher know so the teacher can set them on fire. You know, take your pick. So, what's happening is there are a few things you are being given for as this assignment. You are given an invoice, which is a document that looks, you guys know what an invoice looks like. You're getting a full invoice. You're getting a couple but actually three pieces of sample data, two pieces of sample data, a sample of customer data and a sample of product data. These are examples of what might go into the database. It's not what goes in. You know, you were asked, you as a developer, you asked the client, hey, what kind of information goes into these tables? And they said, here you go. Here's some examples. There is a database design document. The database design document is your shell template, your, do your base document. It's empty. It has set pages and certain spots in it. Sample 1 has an example of how it should be filled out. There once was a time where there's something called a data dictionary, a database dictionary. And you're welcome to go look it up on Wikipedia, what a data dictionary is, depending on what you read, it means one of three possible things. The meaning has changed over the years. 
But essentially, all said and done, what a data dictionary outside the database, what the data dictionary does is it lists out the, con the structure of the database, the fields in it, the who, the why, and the reasoning why you chose certain major choices. We chose this data type for this. This is why we chose that data type. You justify your decisions with the document. It's your documentation. Um, and then what you're going to do is you're going to break down the various documents provided. You're going to create a conceptual ERD. You'll create a logical diagram based on the conceptual. And then you're going to create a physical diagram based on the logical. Does that look familiar compared to what I just finished doing on the board? In 45 minutes, I did an equivalent almost of this assignment with a little more data, and I did it by myself. You guys are working as a group of two or three, so it's up to you how you choose to provide it. What you're going to provide in the end is a single Word document. Inside the Word document has all the bits and pieces, you know, all the things filled out. And part of the document explains, oh, Dan was the, the, did the conceptual diagram, and Joe Bob did the physical. It explains who had what job. You can even choose to have two people do diagramming and having a third person doing the, the QA, the quality assurance on it. So if two of you are really good at diagramming and one of you is okay at nitpicking, you can get the person doing the nitpicking to look over all the work. And that's a perfectly valid job. Because that person still has to understand what's valid and what's not valid. If you do have a QA person and you lose points on your naming conventions, you know who to blame. So in the end, like I said, it's one single Word document. Everything's in it. So the parts where you provide a doc, uh, an ERD, you download the PNG and you put it inside the Word document. You take the ER, the, the, the toad diagram, and you export it as a PNG. You take it and you put that PNG inside the Word document. Basic word processing skills, but that's what it is. Now, this is all on Blackboard, but you should be able to here, break it down. It's 30 points. So this assignment's out of 30 points. Conceptual, worth five points. Does it show all the important entities? Does it show the connections between them? In other words, is it a proper conceptual diagram? You can go to Blackboard to the assignment so you don't have to squint at the screen. You want to just, you know, not squint. Logical ERD. Does it show all the important, it's basically, does it have all of this, plus does it show what's important attributes? In other words, what's not null? If there's anything else you should be including. The physical. Does it have everything that's in the design document? In other words, if you made some notes in there about, you know, I chose to be an integer, and this is why, and you decide to make that feel a numeric instead of an integer, you know, there's going to be problems there because you're not matching out what you agreed to in the document. Naming conventions are being followed. Five points. I take off one point per mistake. The naming convention is only in the last diagram, the actual one in Toad, right? The physical diagram is where the naming conventions are applied. These are five free points. They're all yours, but every mistake you make, I take off a point. It's a terrible way to go from an A to, to an A, from an A plus to an A. Are the relationships properly defined? Are you actually doing the crow's foot properly? Are they going to the right spots? Did you just make the right decisions for required, not required? You know, is it one to many, optional, many, required one, that kind of stuff. Then there's that application of database design theory, five points. This is the fuzzy one. As in, did you cover all the basics? Like, based on this, dia this document, did you actually do everything you were supposed to do? Yes or no? And then the other one is, is your database design properly normalized? In other words, is it broken down the way it should be? Yes or no? Two weeks. That doesn't mean start now. Two weeks. But it gets worse. You're saying, how can it be worse? Because it's that time of the year, the term. It's magical. They did a keystroke and something changed on the screen. Test one. You have one week to do it. It's online, in Blackboard. There is no hybrid assigned to you this week. That gives you an hour to write this test. 
that you're supposed to have a reserve for other things. Yeah, everything gets dumped on at the same time. Such is life. However, the way it's designed is you have a week to do this test, you have two weeks to do the assignment. My tests historically take half an hour to 45 minutes. It is open book because it's take home. It's not like I'm going to sit behind you at your house and go, don't cheat. Yes. Um, hold on. Let me just hit the back the back button. Starts at 7 p.m. I don't want people doing the test as I finish my lecture. Ah, you have one week plus whatever the rest of the day. So in other words, 7 p.m. to midnight next week to finish it. How many tries do you get? One. It's a test. It's not a hybrid, it's not a quiz, it's a test. Yes. It's the equivalent of a midterm, but I don't make you do it in the classroom like some other teachers. I give you a whole week open book to do it. And it's based on the textbook. You are not timed. You can save and come back to it. You have a whole seven days to do it. Give yourself 20 minutes a day, 50 minutes a day, while you're sitting on the shitter, instead of playing Sudoku. Do three questions. Hey? Yes. There are multiple choice, multiple guess, true, false. You can save until you hit the final submit. Once you submit, it's gone. Okay? This is when Dan piles on the crap, and then in two weeks, we're back to almost nothing to do for a few weeks. So it's good. I do mine in bursts. And I time it so that, realistically, usually you don't have a lot going on in the other courses. If I timed it right, based on my history, I've got it pretty good that you're probably not getting slammed in any other class, except maybe achieving success. Because it's achieving success. Any last minute questions? If you don't know how to form a group, um, if you go under student tools, I believe, and in here you will have groups. You want to create yourself a group. It, my options look different from your options. I don't know exactly what yours looks like. There should be a way to create your own groups. Hang on, let me double check. Student tools. Groups, create group. You give it a name. You know what I really like you guys to do? Is put the members of the group as part of the group name. Unlike in the past where I've had is, you know, Alpha Strike, the best group. It means nothing to me. I, once I go in, I can see who's part of the group, but it's a real pain in the ass when somebody says, I need you to kick somebody out of my group. What's your group called? Oh, I don't remember. There's only 40 of you here. When there's 120 of you, it's a different story. Um, and basically, you do this. You can set maximum group members. So whoever creates the group, you can say maximum three. Then you tell your partners, this is what I call the group. And then you can just join the group. Okay. Yes, no more than three. That doesn't say it won't let you create a group of two, but no more than three. Because there's not enough work for three people. I mean, for four people, or five, or six. As you can tell, I've had people ask this question before. No more than three. OK. Any last minute questions? Last next week's a work period, so you know you're feel free to also ask questions next week. Huh. Yeah, oh yeah, you can ask questions next. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. 
Pardon me? Okay, uh, that's a separate issue than this. Let's see afterwards what I can do. Okay, this is going to be a quick little bit of lecture. Um, it's because I want to keep you guys and the guys on Thursdays in sync, and they're getting this this Thursday because they got this last week. So it's just to keep you guys in sync. Okay, I'm going to talk about SQL, which is the next topic. This is what you guys are going to be doing after we come back. So I'm actually only going to do the first little bit of this. Um, whereas the other guys are going to get more of it because they actually get their labs before their lecture, which kind of sucks. The next topic we're going to be taking after we're done with the design aspect of this is SQL. SQL, in actual fact, as you can see, I got three points on here, but I'm actually only covering the first point, <laughs> which is what I'm worried about today. SQL is a special purpose programming language. It's designed to do one thing. Now, something I don't think they teach you guys is the difference between a special purpose language and a general purpose language. A general purpose language is a language you can write any kind of computer program in. It may not be the most efficient code, but it's general purpose. In other words, Java is a general purpose language. Uh, C Sharp, C++, Basic, PHP, Python, those are all general purpose languages. They're designed to do one thing, or many things, and do them adequately. A special purpose language is a language that's designed to do one thing and only one thing, and it does it really, really well. SQL is a special purpose language. It was designed to do one thing well, which is talk to the database. There are other special purpose languages, ones known as R. Anybody here ever study statistics? Okay, two. There's actually one more than I usually get out of a group of 40 students, which I don't have 40 in here, so... You know, it's actually really good. There's a language called R. It's designed specifically for doing stats. That's all it does is statistics. So there are special purpose languages, but SQL is not one of them. In the early 1970s, SQL was created by IBM. Yay. And originally they called it SQL. Structured English Query Language. Thus, the stupid pronunciation of SQL today as SQL. <coughs> they had to change it to SQL because it was a trademark infringement. There was a company in the UK that had trademarked worldwide the word SQL. I don't remember what its purpose was in life, but it was vaguely related to databases. But it wasn't. But IBM said, okay, this isn't worth the fight. We're going to step away from this. So what's happened is SQL is still being called SQL by people because of this. SQL is known as an initialism. If you don't know what initialism is, is it is a word using, you pronounce the actual letters of the word as opposed to an acronym where you pronounce the word. For example, CSIS is an acronym. SQL is an initialism. Just so you know, I get anal retentive over that when I hear people call SQL SQL because it's not SQL, it's SQL. It takes the exact same amount of time to say it. The first commercial version came out on Oracle version 2 for the VAX computers. It's old. The first official standard was established in 1986. It was known as SQL 86. And then the 1999 standard is... Um, came out obviously 1999 and it included things such as recursion triggers and regex. That's supposed to be a comma, not an M. But if you know where the M is, you know why that's a comma. Then 2003 2006, they introduced XML because they thought XML was a good thing to shove in a database. And in 2008, they included something special called truncate as officially part of the language. I talk about truncate as part of the first real lecture on SQL later. And instead of this has to do with triggers. So in 99, they introduced something called triggers. In 2008, they added something to it. And right now, they're sitting at SQL 2011. Now, <coughs> here's what's funny. 90% of the database servers offer 90% of the 99 standard. 
So 90% of the nanonine standard, so 90% of 90% offer this. The rest of them offer some of this, some of this, and almost none of this. So what's happening is the, the body that creates the SQL standards keeps saying, these are great, cool features to have. And they add in a big, fat document, and then they give it to all, then the, all the database developers look at it and go, whatever. <laughs> no, really. Then they look through the book, and they go, oh, that's a cool feature. Oh, Oracle's already got that. So we've got to make sure we offer the same thing. Oh, Microsoft is already doing this. So Oracle says, whatever, we're Oracle. We're going to ignore Microsoft. But everybody else does it, too. All of this is a measuring stick on how much your database server can do. SQL 99 is enough for 95% of applications. That last 5% is covered in here, and then a little bit in there. Postgres is currently SQL 2008 compliant the most. It's the most advanced database server of the bunch. It offers most of 2008, most of 2003 and 2006, and almost all of 99, just so you know. Um, but yeah, SQL 99, that's the one we all play with. And by the way, the, the, when I'm teaching you guys SQL, it'll be closer like SQL 93. Why? Because you almost don't need anything past 93 to do most work. You guys are going to be learning almost the same SQL standard I learned when I went to school. Why? Because it does the job. Okay, now, the SQL language is a three-part affair, and it's not a picky language. Now, I've got to be careful when I say it's not picky. It's made up of three pieces. So, the SQL language as a whole has three subsets. And there's the data definition language, the DDL. That's what's used to define and create objects. In other words, you want to create a table? There's a command for creating a table. You want to change the table? There's a command for changing the table. There's a command for deleting a table. And there's a few other odds and ends inside of that. But its entire purpose is to maintain the structure. It's the blueprints of the database. In other words, it's the bricks and mortar and the walls of the contents of your database. That's the DDL. If you actually want to actually really think about it, this diagram is the blueprint. The DDL is the construction company that builds your house. So if you want like a real world visualization, that's the blueprint, that's the construction company. And whereas if anybody here has ever built their own house, I don't know if anybody had the experience of getting a custom house built for them. Yeah, you know how many times they revise that house? You go, stairs aren't supposed to be there, they're supposed to be there. Or, I ordered not those cupboards, those are the neighbor's cupboards. I'm actually making fun of one of my coworkers who had to go every day and he'd actually walk around with a big red spray paint and spray paint things when he screwed up big red X's on everything daily. Claridge. <laughs> I don't know. Then there's the DML, the data manipulation language. That is the part of the language that actually deals with the insides of the house. In other words, the furniture, the windows, the pictures, you know, the description of what's inside. Or if you want to turn it around the other way around, this is a classroom. Pretend this is a table and each of you are the instances. And since I'm the one that can mess with you guys, I'm the DML. I can add students, I can take students out, I can directly change students, theoretically. I can change your grades. So, you know, I can change students. That's the DML. You can add data, update data, delete data. That's its purpose in life. You're dealing with the data, the instances of the information. Then the DCL, the data control language. That's security. Now, the, I don't cover this one at all in this course, just so you know. Not covered at all. That's database administration work. So you're creating users, you're giving permissions to users to access part of the database, not access part of the database, to do various things with the database. It's to control who can touch it. In other words, it's the decision who you allow in the front door and if you decide it's allowed to use the bathroom or not. The language is case insensitive. So the language itself is case insensitive. It, 
Whether you use the word select, uppercase, lowercase, mixed case, it doesn't care. Objects and data is usually case sensitive. Postgres is case sensitive. It's case sensitive about the object names and what's inside the text, inside the data. Microsoft SQL Server depends, like I said before. Oracle is case insensitive sometimes, unless you tell it otherwise. MySQL is always case insensitive because it's stupid. So that if you are trying to find, if you're trying to find somebody's name and they admit they put in a typo and they put in capital D, capital A, N I E L, and somebody else is capital D, lowercase Daniel, and you ask it to find everything that starts with D A, it's going to give it to you whether it matters. You can't actually specify uppercase, lowercase, unless you actually t make changes on the server. Actually, the actual server itself, you have to make changes. MySQL's dumb because it's really, really hard to find this stuff. It uses spaces as keyword delimiters. I already explained that. Select space name space from space users. It limits each of the words. It separates it just like a language. The command terminator is a semicolon, just so you know. This is something you should be aware of by now because you're learning to program in Java. What do you put at the end of your command in Java? What do you put at the end of your SQL command? Semicolon. It's just like most C-like languages. Now, SQL is kind of weird because if you issue just one command, it doesn't need the semicolon because it's only one command. You need the semicolon when you issue more than one command. Just putting it out there. So when I'm actually typing stuff and doing demos on the screen, you may notice that sometimes I put a semicolon and sometimes I don't because I take a brain fart. And I forget to put in the semicolon. That's all. Okay. So, command terminator is a semicolon. That you got to remember when I start actually doing examples and stuff in two weeks. You'll refer back to this.